morning, guys. Um, I'm happy, sad to know that this is the last session. I'm hoping that there'll be a lot more energy over here, but uh, I mean, I don't want to keep you away from the end of the day kind of a thing. So before we jump into the whole presentation and details and what I wanted to talk about, I just wanted to start with a very quick introduction to Cloud9 for those who don't know. Um, so Cloud9 Hospitals is the largest chain of maternity uh, and childcare hospitals in the country. We have about 14 centers that are spread across the entire country, all the way from Chandigarh to Chennai. Uh, and the core of our business is basically the pregnancy journey uh, and pediatrics after that, right? The context about that is very critical as we go into uh, this discussion because uh, in today's talk, rather than talking about uh, here are the 15 out-of-the-box things that are happening in healthcare and here's stuff that's 10 years away, here's stuff that's 15 years away, I wanted to talk about specifically things that we are doing at Cloud9. Some of this um, is cutting edge, a lot of this is cutting edge, but you will be able to see actual impact of some of these things that we've done over here. right? Um, again, a little bit more context about myself. Um, I'm the chief digital officer and the chief marketing officer at Cloud9, uh, Cloud9 Hospitals. And there's, I think, a trend that's happening in a lot of places, right? So uh, more and more technology and marketing is being thought of as, as one unit, as working together kind of a thing. And prior to joining Cloud9, I was actually an entrepreneur in the health tech space. So besides maternity and childcare, uh, I have some more exposure in terms of chronic disease management and generally uh, healthcare issues and stuff like that. So with that, let me um, jump into the discussion. So see, everything that we do at Cloud9 is focused on two main pillars, right? From a technology perspective, at least. So there is the doctor and there's the customer. Um, and the role of technology or role of operations management is basically to make sure that that interaction between the doctor and the customer is as fruitful uh, and as effective as possible, right? Um, what that basically means is that from a customer perspective, we have to do everything that we can to make the customer experience better, right? Um, when I talk about this in a little more detail, you'll understand how this is kind of different from most other healthcare setups. Now, our um, business focuses on maternity and childcare, which means that most of our customers, rather almost all of our customers, are in between the age group of 25 to 35 to 40 kind of a thing. Hence, these are completely millennials or younger than that, right? So they're used to the Ola, Uber kind of an experience. They're used to ordering food on Swiggy and getting everything in their hand very quickly. So the way we have to deliver technology to them is very different from healthcare in general. The other interesting thing or the important thing to note specifically with respect to Cloud9 is that given the nature of our customers, the way they perceive technology is, is kind of different. So when I was uh, doing my startup and I was working on chronic disease management, one of the things I realized was that when you speak to a diabetic or you're speaking to a hypertensive, one of the most important things that technology does from a customer experience perspective over there is to remind them that you're sick, right? Uh, on the other hand, in, in pregnancy, the mothers are dying to engage with the hospital and the doctor in any way, way possible. So I'll talk about an app that we built and you will see that our uptake was, was insane within a very, very short period of time. So that's going to be one major chunk of my discussion. Uh, around what we have done from a customer experience perspective. The other area, which is around the doctors, um, the main thing that we're trying to do with technology is how do we digitally empower them, right? Uh, so how do we make them more efficient? How do we actually uh, provide decision support systems, help them augment their own, uh, their own practice, and so on and so forth? And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what's happening over here. Uh, Obviously, let's keep this a little bit of an open session. So if anybody has any thoughts, any ideas, any questions that you want at any point of time, just raise your hands. It's a small hall, so I should be able to catch that kind of a thing. So before we uh, jump into any of these topics, I just wanted to set some ground about uh, two main things as far as healthcare and more importantly, Cloud9, our philosophy uh, is concerned. So when you think about hospitals, you basically think about um, slightly archaic IT systems. Honestly speaking, I think in general, healthcare is where banking was about 10, 15 years ago, but it's catching up pretty fast. So with that context, before we started this journey about three, four years ago, we kind of tried to understand what is our um, philosophy from a technology perspective, right? Um, so whenever you look at any system that is there in any company, you can broadly break them up into two parts. So there would be systems of engagement and then systems of records. Now, 
Systems of records are basically the backend systems in our, in the way we have defined it, right? So these are the ERPs, these are the databases, these are the systems that are providing the support for all the other tech systems that are there. And systems of engagement are basically the systems with which any of your stakeholders is dealing with. So think of this as a front end or a UI uh, that either a doctor deals with or a customer interacts with kind of a thing. So from a tech philosophy perspective, we decided that anything that is a system of record generally, um, we'll try to use leverage, uh, we'll, we'll leverage basically robust systems over there, right? There's no question of thinking, yaar, ye hum bana lenge. let's look at best practices, let's look at the best company that can provide that, sub, that uh, software, and we'll use that. On the other hand, as far as the systems of engagement are concerned, we took a call of building this technology in-house, which means that I actually have a team of about 10, 15 developers who are actually working on various projects uh, focused on improving systems of engagement that we have. I'd just like to spend a second more on this. Um, one of the reasons we actually went in that direction was because in a company that isn't uh, technology at the core, uh, when, you're, when you're working in a company like that, what typically happens is that if, if a business or the customer comes up with, a, with an idea and says, you know what, this feature is going to be useful, uh, the time it takes for that feature to actually get implemented is so long that the business and customer have both lost interest in that feature altogether, right? So you will go to a vendor, you will go and ask him, ki, yaar, ye banane mein kitna time lagega? he'll come and say, ki, itna karcha lagega. your finance team will approve it, so on and so forth. And before the feature starts getting developed, it's already a month and the entire business has lost interest in that. And hence we took this call of saying that at least the systems of engagement are something that we would like to build on our own kind of a thing. And of course we've used some smart, acts, uh, smart hacks, um, used some technologies that basically make development simpler in that direction. The other quick thing that I wanted to just highlight was uh, the applications of AI that we're seeing in healthcare and more specifically what we're doing in, in Cloud9, right? Uh, I think this would have been touched in these three days multiple times, but when you think about AI, I could broadly, AI ML, I could broadly classify into two big buckets. Uh, the first bucket is how can machine learning or AI uh, replace human intelligence, right? So this is basically about doing tasks that are generally straightforward in nature. So these are tasks in which I'm as good as, as you are. For example, identifying pictures of, uh, of dogs in a whole thing, or identifying which one is color red. I might struggle with that, I'm slightly colorblind. But in general, you will see that people are, are pretty much uh, the same on this. So there are some tasks within healthcare where human intelligence gets applied. Uh, one of those is, for example, transcribing text, right? So a doctor writes a prescription, uh, and how do we transcribe that prescription into a digital format? Now, there again, there is a little bit of a subjectivity because typically when a doctor writes a prescription, either his wife or the pharmacist can understand that. Almost nobody else in the world can. But then, let's ignore that for a second. Uh, other examples could be sorting medicines, um, you know, some kind of com complex computations and so on and so forth. So this, I think, was where we thought, yeah, someday AI will come and it will take away jobs, right? So this was the area where we thought it will happen. The larger and more important uh, use use of AI in healthcare is around SME intelligence, right? So where you're essentially augmenting um, a doctor's existing expertise rather than saying we'll replace you, right? Uh, and that is where you will see, I believe, the most amount of application of AI in healthcare in, in the near future. We're definitely seeing that at Cloud9 for sure, right? And some examples of this, are, this is uh, triaging. So before uh, a customer walks into the consultation, can we actually ask him a few questions that are relevant and make the consultation more uh, efficient kind of a thing? Similarly, uh, decision support systems for radiology, for pathology, so on and so forth. I'll spend a little more time on this uh, going forward. I just wanted to bring this up because these kind of anchor the discussion um, in the next few slides. So now going to uh, the customer experience piece, basically when we started looking at customer experience, we actually did a lot of homework before we could decide what do we tackle and how do we tackle it, right? Uh, so, as I mentioned, the pregnancy customer is different from a typical diabetic, a, a typical hypertensive. Their expectations are different. What they want from technology is different. So we actually did a bunch of time motion analysis. We actually looked at, uh, did a bunch of focus group discussions with customers who were in the pregnancy journey and who had already delivered and, and left. And uh, we could essentially classify all the activities they do in three broad buckets. The first is the core set of activities which, as you must have guessed by now, is the activity or the actions that the customer does with the doctor. So when they come to the hospital, the core activity that they do is basically going and meeting the doctor and the time they spend with the doctor, right? Everything else is secondary. It's either enabling that experience or it's enhancing that experience. So the next 
circle around that is enhancing stuff, right? So this would be things around um, how convenient is it for me to book my lab test, can I get my lab reports, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally there is enabling. So this is around uh, your appointment management system, how much do I have to wait, et cetera, et cetera. Now from a philosophy perspective, we said that uh, we need to aid and support the core activities and we need to make the enabling and enhancing activities as seamless as possible. So while we've done a lot of things, I'll just pick up two or three areas and I'll talk about that. Uh, and I think you'll find these interesting. Um, on the core side, one of the challenges that we tried to solve was electronic medical records, right? And this is probably the biggest challenge globally, not just in India. Uh, so while US and a few other countries are at a very high level of uh, EMR adoption, the challenge over there is that it's leading to physician burnout, right? Uh, doctors are actually even thinking about suicide, moving out of their jobs, moving out of profession because of the amount of documentation that they have to do. And honestly, there hasn't been a good system that's been developed across specialities that will make it really, really straightforward for people to enter the, for doctors to enter medical records. I think there are a few uh, products in silos. For example, there's a product called DocOn that does this very well for pediatrics, but it doesn't exist as a whole. So we'll talk about what we did over there to actually improve uh, capture of EMR. The second part was around the enhancing part, and this is where our app steps in. So while app is not really, an app is not really emerging uh, technology as such, but honestly, the way we have used the uh, mobile application for the customer is kind of different from most healthcare providers. The more important aspect in the app is the amount of data that we've been able to generate from there and what we've done with that. And finally, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the enabling side, which was the appointment booking system. Uh, and that, again, is something that we actually developed in-house, uh, and we've rolled out, and we are working on predicting wait times and so on and so forth. So as far as the medical records is concerned, as I mentioned, there are a bunch of challenges with, uh, with the documentation, right? So we already had an HIS and EMR where people could, where doctors could enter the records. But there are two or three factors. So there are some specialities for which it is tougher to um, create a very structured format to capture notes, right? Uh, gynecology is one of those specialties because customers can come in all, all shapes and forms. Pediatrics is relatively more straightforward. The other factor is that when a doctor is seeing 80, 90, 100 patients a day, it becomes a bit difficult for them to now learn a new system and start entering uh, records into that. Um, we've also seen that some of the most uh, some of the busiest doctors are also the most senior doctors, so it's that much more tougher for them to adopt to a new technology kind of a thing. So one of the things that we did here was to see if we can capture prescriptions without, um, without getting them to type anything, right? Uh, and I'm going to play a small video in the background. So this is a technology called uh, Docsper, and there are a bunch of other technologies like this. So when a cu customer walks into the hospital, they pick up a paper like this, right? Uh, and this paper has... Uh, the front part is kind of empty, you can write whatever you want, and the back part has boxes where you can tick off saying so-and-so lab, so-and-so scan, and then pharmacy, etc., etc. Now the patient gets the vitals done and this walks into the doctor's chambers. The doctor has a digital pen with which uh, the doctor writes on this paper, and as and when the doctor writes stuff, it just gets entered into the system in real time kind of a thing. Uh, and obviously now we will sit and transcribe this, we will actually change this into solid electronic medical records kind of a thing. So as you can see, the doctor just ticked that test and it showed up over here. As they're writing the medicines, it's kind of uh, coming in over there, right? So what is already done is that every time they tick something, it goes in a proper machine-readable format into our system. So even though you walked out with a paper prescription, you can open up your app and you will find a solid electronic medical record over there, right? Which basically means that uh, you can essentially place an order for, uh, for this thing over there. Just one second. Yeah, that's better. So um, this had like three different, uh, three different outcomes as such. One of them was essentially around, uh, sorry, I think I'm having some trouble with this. Can you just skip that? Hey, just help me skip this one. Yeah, that's better. So um, the three main outcomes that came out of using this technology was the first one being something called computerized physician order entry, which basically means that is the doctor providing a machine-readable format in which I enter the order for labs, for scans, and for pharmacy, okay? If you go to any hospital and you say, kya chal raha hai, kitna medical records hai, the bare minimum to sound even decently sophisticated is that you have CPOE, 
right? And this has a lot of implications because this makes sure that you have no leakage. So unless you know what medicines are being prescribed, as a hospital, you don't know if those medicines are being purchased inside your hospital or outside the hospital, right? So this becomes a very critical thing. Uh, and now we are able to do it through transcribing the handwritten, handwritten note as well. Uh, there is also a big medical legal ag uh, angle for this. Now, earlier when there was a simple paper and the customer would walk away with the paper, we would have no record of what the doctor had told uh, the patient during the OP, OP journey. Now we have a record of that. So in a court of law, all of this can be adm is admissible, right? And then obviously there is AI that you can pull on top of the SOAP notes and you will... Uh, SOAP notes are basically subjective, objective assessment and plan. These are the four parts of a typical prescription as such. Okay? I have another video which talks about the app and I'm sure I'm going to end up in the same trouble. So just help me out of it. Bye, Sambhal Lena. So, on the app front, um, again, this is a very quick video. Uh, basically, the app is called It's Our Baby, right? And honestly, it shows the emotion we put into um, how we treat our customers at Cloud9. Every baby is our baby kind of a thing. Uh, and it's pretty... It's pretty straightforward in the, in the sense that you can book your appointments, you can open up your medical records. Um, if the doctor is given a prescription on that docs per pen, you'll be able to see it uh, in the system. You'll be able to place orders from there on kind of a thing. The additional thing that we have done, given the segment we operate in, is that there is a community that is built for pregnant mothers to talk to each other. So we've got something called due date clubs, right? So which means that three people who have their uh, due dates in the same month, they can actually get together and have a discussion kind of thing. And then there is content around their pregnancy. So for every week of pregnancy, we provide them specific content and stuff like that. So that is uh, generally the app. If you, if you guys are interested, I would really urge you to uh, download the app and have a look at it. Uh, it's a fairly interesting app and, and we're kind of proud of it. Um, the other part in this was about the level of uptake that we got. Okay, as I said, um, pregnant customers are, I mean, the customer segments that we work with is very, very different from uh, the other healthcare providers, right? So here, as soon as the app came out, we saw that people just jumped in and, you know, downloaded the app and we had no problem pushing it whatsoever. Just help me go to the door. Yeah. So on the uptake side, like some of the most encouraging things was that within like six months of launch, close to about 85% of our customers were already using the app, right? This is unheard of in healthcare. Like a lot of hospitals have tried to build their own app, um, but nobody has been able to exceed like a 10-15% mark. The other interesting thing is that close to 60% of our paid appo appointments are paid through the app kind of a thing. So you can imagine how much manpower and uh, effort we're saving on. Uh, this obviously doesn't mean that I let go of the billing staff. It's just that now they are deployed and doing something which is more related relationship focused with the customer rather than just doing transactional activities kind of a thing. And because of the data that we're able to generate, we're now at a stage where, where we are beginning to get insights about the customer. So for example, one of the things that has stood out is that we apparently have six different customer personas among the people who are using the app, right? And now I'm able to predict uh, what works well for a certain persona. So for example, one persona is uh, mothers who are below 27 years of age uh, and are working, and others who are not working kind of a thing. And there's very different behavior in terms of what they browse, what they look at, which doctors do they go, so on and so forth, uh, go to so on and so forth. Yeah? So that's as far as the um, app is concerned. The other part was basically around uh, the enabling, enabling part. So see, in healthcare, one of the challenges is that most people have very low expectations from an experience perspective, right? So when we did an initial focus group discussion, um, most customers came and said, Ki yaar, we asked them, do you have a problem waiting? He says, yeah, doctor ke paas jaoge, to wait to karna hi padega, right? And they're like, if you're not waiting for the doctor, then perhaps he's not a very good doctor kind of a thing. So the expectations in healthcare are actually very, very low, right? Yet, this used to be one of the prime complaints that used to come to us, okay? Uh, in all of our feedback that we used to collect, people used to talk about it, the waiting time is just insane, uh, and the busier the doctor, the longer it is kind of a thing, which means more people are complaining about the wait time sort of a thing. Uh, the, uh, the reason we actually wanted to fix this was basically because we are not a traditional healthcare provider, right? So we ought to provide the same experience that a Swiggy and, and Zomato does. So in this direction, what we did was, uh, we said we have to pick up the entire activity of predicting wait time. And for this, uh, first thing was that we actually built our own appointment management system. So we had a vendor in place, we got rid of them, built our own system, so on and so forth. And now we are at a stage where we are using some, of, uh, some factors to determine how long will it take for your consultation to actually begin. Um, now, given we have an ecosystem where we are able to see what the doctor is doing, what the patient is doing, we are able to track that if there's an emergency, there will be an X impact on the, on the wait time. Similarly, what is the nature of the consultation, right? So, 
is, is the patient coming in the first trimester, the second trimester, is it the first consultation, is it a follow-up, so on and so forth. Also, we've seen that the demographics of the patient and the way the doctor behaves impacts the consultation time to a great extent. And then there is obviously the doctor's behavior. And finally, there is location of the patient. So one of the interesting insights when we started doing this was that say we predicted that, uh, and I kind of got beaten up for that to quite some extent. Uh, when we rolled this out initially, we used to just send out saying, hey, your, your consultation is expected to be delayed by 25 minutes, right? So what happened on one of these days was that a few patients actually delayed their arrival depending on that notification. And then there was this one time uh, where a doctor who literally sees 90 patients in a day had 10 minutes of vacant time because no patient was there kind of a thing, right? And then we got beaten up so bad that we had to actually modify the message that kind of goes out. So in healthcare, you can afford anything, but you can't afford your doctor actually not being productive kind of a thing, right? So that was one of the learnings from, from this, and hence we started taking the location of the patient into account when we started making these predictions. Now moving on to the last part, which is about empowering the doctor. Um, when we started thinking about the doctor, we said, what can we really do to help the doctor provide better care to the customer, right? Uh, and on that, we kind of arrived at three, three main areas. So the first was, we should be able to provide very clear patient information to the doctor, okay? Um, again, if you're coming from a different industry, you will think, yaar, haan, matlab, mobile app, mein they should have this data, but honestly, in healthcare, this doesn't really happen. Um, so doctors, for example, have no way of accessing the customer's, uh, customer's profile and customer's data unless they're sitting in the hospital kind of a thing. So we said we need to make that handy and available to the doctor. And in a specialty like gynecology, what happens is that the doctor shares his or her phone number with the patient. A lot of times the patient will give him a call in the middle of the night, uh, ask a certain query. And if you don't know what their lab reports were the last time, you will be you know, running around trying to get that information sort of a thing. So we said we need to make the patient information available very easily and freely in the, in the doctor's hands. The second part was around effectiveness, okay? Uh, and by effectiveness, I'll spend, I'll uh, talk about this in more detail when we get into that section. Um, the entire journey of the patient is around nine months, right? So while there are a lot of outpatient consultations, labs, and et cetera, et cetera, that happens, the core of the experience for a pregnant mother is when the baby is delivered. Okay? And if that core experience doesn't happen with Cloud9, then there is really not much fun in the entire experience kind of a thing. So we said, how can we actually help the doctor uh, get more effective in terms of getting us the final, final experience, which is the pregnancy, exp the delivery experience happening at Cloud9. And finally, there is clinical decision support system. So this is in terms of augmenting intelligence that I spoke about earlier. I'll spend very little time on this and talk about a few examples uh, about stuff that we have done. And also there are a bunch of... Uh, startups and technology firms working a lot on this. On the patient information front, again, I have a very quick video, but I'll, I think we'll just uh, quickly run through that. So the app that we've basically created for the doctor helps in getting all the, um, uh, all the schedule, the patient's uh, lab reports, his last prescription, all of that stuff readily available uh, in their phone itself. Unfortunately, you can't download this app because this is primarily for Cloud9 doctors only. Uh, they're able to see their schedule across a week, the next month, so on and so forth. Uh, they can check out how many consultations they have, how many IP admissions have happened, so on and so forth. The other thing that we also did was we started adding some amount of um, non-clinical insights to the, uh, uh, to the doctor in this, right? Which basically means that uh, things around, did they do a bed booking, right? Uh, did they have any challenges with the call center? Did, some, did they provide a bad feedback somewhere kind of a thing? Now, all of these things basically provide more information to the doctor uh, so that he can engage with the patient better, right? Uh, and this is where the medical records and all, uh, all kind of come in. And finally, we also had uh, used the same portal to do two more things, which was basically provide analytics to the doctor about saying, um, how many consultations did I do today? How, much, how many inpatient deliveries do I have? So on and so forth. And second, uh, to manage their profile as well, right? So which basically means that uh, your profile on the website, your profile on social media, all of this gets updated over here in the app by the doctor, and it reflects real time on our website and on different portals kind of a thing. So again, uh, this was one of those examples where, where, where we found that doctors are actually very, very enthusiastic to engage, right? Uh, so while there's a perception that they are kind of less tech savvy, not so keen on engaging with technology, when we release this app, we realize that that's not really the case. Yeah? Okay. Skip. So that was on the, on the doctor app as such. Um, can you just help me from that? So besides 
the set of data that we provide, there is also a means for ongoing engagement with the customer, right? So there is an opportunity to chat with the customer, any specific questions also flow through this. See, essentially the benefit of creating this system is that we now, the two most critical assets that we have in the system, which is the customers and the doctors, we have technolo technologically enabled both of them, and now that data, that pipe that we have created, that has a lot of value sort of a thing. On the um, engagement as such, which is the effectiveness part, see, the pregnancy journey, as I said, it starts with your first consultation, and there is something called an early pregnancy scan in which a pregnancy gets confirmed. So that's the beginning of your journey, and finally, the end of your journey is basically a delivery. Now, in this process, there, is, uh, there are three trimesters, the first, second, and third trimester. There are a bunch of consultations that happen in these trimesters. There are a bunch of lab tests that, uh, that are done, scans that are done. Um, and all of this, this gets done, and then finally they deliver in the, in the third trimester kind of a thing. So we've actually seen that while almost all of our customers who come and engage with us initially do deliver with us, there are a few that actually move away for various reasons. One of the reasons could be that they just want to go back, uh, go back home uh, to their hometown and deliver and stuff like that, right? But there are a bunch of reasons like that. So the, re the analysis that we did over here or the model that we created over here was focused on seeing if we can predict how a customer will behave in the inpatient, in the delivery, based on how their behavior has been during the entire outpatient journey. Now for this, we looked at a million data points and we were able to build a model which is about 90% not accurate. But honestly, there might be some skews in this and we'll have to kind of improve this as we go forward. Um, the interesting insights that came out was that the number of consultations or the amount of engagement that a customer has with the doctor impacts the final delivery to a great extent, right? So doctors who were actually uh, doing eight, nine consultations uh, towards the last trimester had much lower conver uh, conversion as compared to doctors who did like 15 consultations in the last trimester. Similarly, customers who did all of their scans and tests with, with Cloud9 and didn't go somewhere else also converted better. One of the other interesting insights, which was actually counterintuitive, was that if the number of refunds the customer takes increases, then uh, the conversion probability plummets significantly, right? So in healthcare in generally, when you actually give out a refund or something, it essentially means uh, that in some way you are admitting guilt kind of a thing. So anytime, even for a lab test or a cons consultation, you have a refund, it impacts the conver con conversion to a great extent. So that was one very clear use case of machine learning. And this is a model that's just been built. We are improving on it. Uh, but it's, it's hugely, hugely useful because it, it starts throwing us light on whom to prioritize, who needs specific interventions to help them kind of have a more um, healthy pregnancy journey with us and so on and so forth. And then finally comes the clinical support piece, right? Um, now, within clinical distance support, there are typically two parts uh, that we have looked at. Uh, one was around triaging. Right? Uh, and I'll spend a little more time on explaining what's going on over there. And the second was around decision support systems for um, generally providing more guidance to the doctor and so on and so forth. On the triaging front, what we've basically done is we've done a pre-consultation triage. Now, when you look at the amount of time a doctor spends uh, with a patient in, in consultation, it will vary anywhere between 8 minutes to about uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes kind of a thing, depending on, on who the doctor is, how senior, how busy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One of my other um, insights or discovery from healthcare was that the relationship that the doctor and patient have or the consultation as such is about 10-15% clinical and the remaining 80-85% is actually non-clinical. It's about how they behave, um, how that engagement really happens and stuff like that. Clinical part is not actually the most significant part. So where we focus triaging, uh, triage basically means having a set of questions answered before uh, the patient actually goes and finally meets the doctor, right? Uh, so there are actually a number of tools out there which, which do this pretty well. I'm sure a lot of you must have heard of Babylon AI. Um, this is actually an AI chatbot that NHS is using for triaging its own uh, populist kind of a thing. So we also built something similar on those lines. And the idea was that can we actually ask a few questions before the uh, customer joins in, uh, joins the doctor in the consultation chamber, which can help the doctor with more information and uh, make sure he's not missing out on anything on one side and just give him more time to generally engage with the customer rather than asking routine questions kind of a thing. So this is something that we've just started working on and the objective of this is basically to improve the efficiency of the consultation as such. The other part is uh, the decision support system in OP. 
an outpatient, right? And here the objective basically is that can we provide specific alerts to the doctor? Uh, can we actually warn him about, about something? So for example, there might be a few drugs that should not be uh, prescribed during the 23rd, 24th week, right? Uh, so if our system is able to throw out those warnings to the doctor, it's, it's immensely helpful. Right? Uh, and this, as a part of our system of engagement, is like a core piece because we don't want the doctor to directly engage with the existing HIS. We are creating a layer on top of the HIS uh, which we control, on which we actually put an AI, we actually start figuring out what is the best experience that can be provided, kind of a thing. Um, other areas where decision support would be uh, very much used is, in our case, uh, radiology. So, uh, in the entire pregnancy journey, uh, the, doc the patient would typically uh, consult uh, to a great extent the gynecologist and a radiologist whom we call a fetal medicine specialist, right? Um, and the fetal medicine specialist would basically do the ultrasound scans and stuff like that. Now, fetal medicine is as such a very, very niche speciality. Uh, sometimes we have challenges finding the right fetal medicine specialist as well. So what we're looking at is if we can actually provide a decision support system over there so that a regular radiologist can actually provide the same kind of care. Uh, and have the eye to actually identify some of these, these pieces. A fetal medicine specialist is like a double MD, so he does MD radiology and MD, uh, MD gynecology kind of a thing. So that's one of the areas, yeah, I'm almost done. So that's about the end of, um, end of my conversation. There are, of course, a few more areas where we are, we're working, uh, but I think I'll leave that for some other time or catching up separately. <laughs>